Hello and welcome to FEC TV News at 7 here on FECTV.com. I'm Noel Byrne and joining me is Chris Bennett. Tonight we've got all the latest on the big stories in Ireland and around the world and we're kicking off with the tragic murder of Detective Adrian Dunhu who of course was shot last Friday night at around 9.30 at Lordship Credit Union in County Louth. The married father of two was shot in the head by a gang of five who then fled the scene. Uh, they left with four th only €4,000, uh, apparently leaving behind uh, a substantial amount of 40000 Gardaí from all around the country are offering their help, with around 100 Gardaí uh, understood to be believed or understood to be taking part in the investigation. Uh, they are also working with the PSNI in Northern Ireland to establish the connection of, uh, of the possibility that a criminal uh, gang from across the border is involved. That's right. It was originally thought that uh, distant Republicans may have had some hand in it, but that has now been shut down, and it is clearly focused the investigation on a criminal gang. A burnt-out Volkswagen Passat was found in County Armagh, and that's currently being uh, examined by the PSNI um, to see if there's any evidence they can uh, retrieve from that. Uh, Minister for Justice Alan Shatter made an interesting comment uh, today, Chris. He said that anyone convicted of murdering a Garda should be jailed for 40 years. What do you think of that sort of thing? Um, it's an interesting one because obviously I have uh, every sympathy for, for the Guardian out there who are doing uh, a dangerous job um, and one that obviously puts them in, in potentially uh, life-threatening situations. Um, my one thing about that would be t it's a difficult thing to put uh, a sentence of so let's say one uh, group of society above perhaps the, the killing of uh, any innocent civilian um, is an interesting way to go and I don't necessarily think the right one. I think the minister's uh, main point was that the guard, the uh, you know, they work for the state. Um, so it's, as such, killing one is uh, an act of violence against the state itself. Do you do you kind of I, I agree with that, or I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, uh, but again, I suppose the problem there would be that if you opened up a law such as that uh, specifically for for the guards, you would tend to have to have one for uh, let's say ambulance uh, personnel. Uh, ministers and TDs, essentially anyone working for the state uh, as, as their profession uh, would essentially have to be encompassed within that law. And again, I suppose I, I draw it back to whether or not you want something. Th these are people who, uh, you know, tr tragic as the situation is, who are trained to deal with dangerous mm. situations, who are out there with um, more knowledge than an ordinary citizen. Um, and you know, volunteer, I suppose, sign the contract, etc., to put themselves on the line for people. Um, whether or not that deserves, let's say, a higher sentence, I don't necessarily think it would have any impact on, let's say, the amount of crimes that were committed in that case, which is what a law like that should be about. Mm. It'll be interesting to see if the government uh, decide to backtrack on closure of 100 Garda stations this week. I mean, there's a lot of pressure coming from them, as you'd expect from the opposition parties, but I wonder will this, you know, maybe let the government kind of look at the situation in terms of is crime on the rise? People seem to be more worried about, you know, the acts of violence. I mean, uh, on the streets, I wonder, you know, will this spare them on to, to kind of rethink their situation? I mean, certainly there has been a rise in, uh, let's say, violent crime uh, over the last um, couple of weeks. We've seen with obviously the spate of burglaries and now this particularly uh, violent killing. Um, the statistics, when you look at them, are around the, the levels of police numbers compared to their impact upon uh, sort of crime prevention are very difficult to, to, to conclude either way. I think what the government have a choice here, if they are going to go ahead with the closures, they need to make sure that the police numbers that they have left are used in the best possible way. I would suggest more of a presence on the streets of Ireland would be one way to go through that, or they may backtrack and potentially close, let's say, a lesser number of them. Okay, well, moving on now to the news in Brazil of a horrific nightclub fire. That's right. Uh, a fire at the Kiss nightclub in Santa Maria, Brazil, this Sunday claimed the lives of 233 people, with over 100 still in hospital tre being treated for smoke inhalation. The fire started potentially through a pyrotechnics display by a band who were on stage at the club at the time, although there have been reports that one of the uh, people in the band lit a flare which caused uh, material above the stage to catch on fire and then lit the rest of the club. Three people have been arrested so far, the club owner, the chief of security and a band member. Uh, the dead all number young students and most of them died from smoke inhalation. It's a, a real tragedy, Noel. 
Yeah, and it has gripped the uh, people of Brazil and three days of national mourning are taking place at the moment. The first of the funerals also took place earlier today. I suppose from an Irish perspective, Chris, there's certainly echoes of the Stardust incident, which occurred in Dublin on the 14th of February 1981, where 48 people died in a nightclub fire as well. Um, I mean, the, the, I suppose the, thing, uh, the interesting thing here is that from the incident reports that have been coming out since Sunday, late Sunday evening into today, uh, more has been now known about the fire and it does seem to be that it may have been quite preventable. Uh, there are reports that there was only one available exit for those people within the club at the time and that bouncers uh, may have blocked that, believing that the people running towards them were trying to skip out on their bar tabs because they couldn't see the fire itself, which led to a, a backing up of people and obviously those in the back uh, did perish. Uh, and has, it, has it came to light that there were any corners cut in terms of fire safety? It does appear so. The club itself was actually out of, it was in between fire certificates at the time. Now the chief fire officer uh, of the area has said that they were allowed to be open okay. but the club itself was overcrowded there were 1500 people in there uh, at the time of the incident um, and again uh, one of the band members said that when they were on stage dealing with the fire <clears throat> excuse me, in the initial stages, they were handed a fire extinguisher, which itself didn't actually work. Right. So again, it does seem that there are uh, major corners cut with this, uh, with this incident, and it could w very easily have been prevented. That's very unfortunate indeed. Coming back home, and uh, Minister for Cock-Ups, uh, James Riley, who of course is also known <coughs> as the Minister for Health, uh, he's in hot water again today. It's kind of a monthly occurrence at this stage. Uh, documents have emerged to say that he gave the go-ahead to hospital projects in Kilkenny and Wexford. The hospitals uh, in question were actually in constituencies of two high-ranking cabinet ministers, those being Minister for Public Reform, Brendan Howland, and also Minister for the Environment, Phil Hogan. The projects were announced before the HSE boards involved at the hospitals uh, had actually agreed to the changes. So you wouldn't expect this type of cock-up from James Riley, Chris, would you? Um, absolutely not. <laughs> Although, unfortunately, it's not the first time he's, uh, he's got himself into trouble, is it? Um, Fiona Fall have said that they're, again, asking for his resignation uh, for trying to undermine the HSE. It's a bit of a poison chalice though, frankly. It definitely job. is, and I suppose uh, a lot of cynics of Irish politics, of which there are mainly, you know, many. many. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> it's worth noting that the minister uh, this March will have been the Minister for Health for two years. At that point, he can claim a ministerial pension so I don't think you wouldn't be Kenny suggesting that he's going to be sticking around till then. I though, would, would you? bet every dollar on it, Chris, that I'd imagine he'll be there until at least March or April, and at that point, Enda Kenny might give him the boot. But until then, I think we're going to have to stick around for uh, follow cock-ups from Minister for Health James Riley. Yeah. Um, moving on now to Egypt, uh, Mohamed Morsi, the pre uh, president, has declared a state of emergency in Port Said, Suez, and Ismailia following riots over the weekend. More than 50 people were killed uh, to date in anti-government protests and over 600 people have been injured. Uh, Morsi has also invited the opposition to talks to find a peaceful uh, solution to the problems. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. The violence itself erupted in Port Said um, after 21 people were sentenced to death over football protests and riots last year which claimed the lives of 74. The protests and riots then sort of spiralled out of control and took on a life of their own a little bit and incorporated anger and resentment against uh, Mr Morsi's own government. Um, the problem, I suppose, here, Noel, is that with the state of emergency, he's bringing in something that his predecessor had. Yeah, it's a funny one because the laws themselves that he's enacted date back to his predecessor, Hosni Mubarak. So it's kind of a gamble because, you know, the whole point is, you know, he'd, he'd argue that the country is now independent and they're fighting for more, you know, democracy. But at the same time, he's actually using laws from a time that people don't want to live through again. But yet that's kind of what is happening. Now, opposition have actually rejected the, the cause to meet Morsi for what he's calling dialogue. So it'll be interesting to see where they're going to go. It's, it is. I mean, I think it's the right decision um, because the last thing that Egypt needs uh, at the moment is a sustained, prolonged period of further violence. Um, coming through the Arab Spring, reforming the democracy, having elections um, sort of in a, the vague, you know, the recent past. Mm. Um, they're a country that are really should be trying to look forward now and, and look at sort of rebuilding everything. Uh, this is only going to put them a little bit of a step backwards. So if um, these 
uh, emergency legislation is brought in in a way uh, which is, let's say, not too harsh, that the, the, the reaction from mm. uh, Morsi isn't uh, over what should be expected, then I think it's the right decision. I think so, but uh, we'll have to wait and see how it all unfolds. Uh, back in Ireland, once again, a new poll today for marriage, equal in, er, marriage equality has shown that there's been a 12% increase in support for gay marriage, now stands at 75% of the population. The first poll in 2006 saw 51% of Irish people uh, agreeing with the idea of same-sex marriage. That is now up 25% in just six years. Uh, it's an interesting one, Chris, and it's expected that it will be discussed in April at the mm. Constitutional Convention. Do you, do you think we'll see the vote? No. Uh, well, I suppose out the back of those discussions in April, um, I'd imagine, based on these statistics anyway, that there will be a positive outcome and then it will be up to the government to decide whether or not they want to act on you know, the people's opinion, uh, which I suppose if they're a decent government they should do. Um, In terms of the demographics then, what, what, what do the statistics show? Well, kind of as you'd expect, the 18 to 49 year olds, um, they were up as high as 88% um, agreeing with same-sex marriage, while over 65s Again, as you'd expect, 43% asking for the change. I suppose to come back to that, were you saying that the government needing to take, you know, take notice of the people, the huge percentage there of, uh, let's say, the young and the youth uh, people who are essentially going to be those voting for the government for a significant mm. period of time, I suppose they're the people that you really do need to take, uh, take notice of. Was anything said uh, in the report about uh, adoption, about children in, in gay and lesbian households? Yeah, the survey also touched on uh, you know, the rights of gay uh, couples to have children, and 69% said they felt it was more important for children to be raised in a family with loving parents as opposed to just having a mother and father in the home. Well, 60% uh, also said that the definition of family in the Irish Constitution should be changed to reflect same-sex marriage. So, uh, I mean, the statistics aren't as strong as we'd say same-sex marriage, but definitely heading in, in the right direction. It is interesting, yeah, that they, they, they are moving quite convincingly within that direction, and there was no real mention, I suppose, in the survey particularly, of, of the religious angle. No, no mention of the religious angle, but again, it kind of goes back to the over 65s who we'll say would have been brought up and indeed taught as well to live a very much a Catholic way of life and obviously the Catholic Church would be highly opposed to uh, same-sex marriage. So I suppose you can see, uh, you know, remnants of that in, in the way they voted. Absolutely. Uh, our final story of the night is a, is a rather interesting one. A new electronic hymnal has taken the UK by storm after coming from America. Uh, it's controlled from the pulpit uh, and it gives backing music and projects words onto the walls of a church like a giant karaoke machine, uh, allowing the congregation to follow along with the music as it were. Uh, the priest selects his playlist, maybe drop a bit of ABBA in there, that kind of thing, to get people driving. Um, and this was my favourite part of it. You can select not only organ music, but you can also have Caribbean Calypso style. Chris, if there's anything missing from Irish Mass, it's Caribbean Calypso music. Bit of Calypso music. Yeah, as I say, it came from, the, uh, it came from America originally, um, but it was uh, sort of first uh, out, out, you know, uh, unveiled, shall we say, at uh, my favourite trade fair, the Christian Resources Exhibition. Oh, I try to go every year to that. It's a it's, great show. It's a great one. Um, where you could also buy, along with the, the electronic hymnal, um, solar-powered church notice boards and designer cassocks. Lovely, lovely stuff there. Yeah, because their classics are very out of date at the moment. They I mean, are. They're very 1980s. They really need to update They need to them. jazz it up there. Mm. Um, it's, it's certainly the place where you can buy your priest socks uh, for anyone out there watching who needs those. Very, very, very dark blue, I think. Very, very dark blue. I believe we have a, a show coming up tonight that uh, will really be worth a watch. Yes, tonight here live on FECTV.com at 10 o'clock. We've got a special edition of Your Call. We are talking Ireland and whether or not it is being screwed over by the government. Don't forget to tune in. It's set to be a very interesting debate. We're live, as I said, at 10pm on FECTV.com. But that's it for the moment here at the News at 7, so we'll talk to you later on.